us to learn more about the right to repair and the role of intellectual property in the equipment that we purchase. The issues we're discussing today clearly are complex and involve numerous industries with different sorts of patents. And your perspective might be different based on the industry and the type of patent involved. Ultimately, there may be no one-size-fits-all solution for repair, particularly given that some, uh, some misrepairs could jeopardize the health and safety of users, while others would not. And for that reason, it seems to me that regulations that govern, say, the repair of an airplane or an x-ray machine should differ from the regulations for the repair of ordinary household appliances or even maybe a computer. Um, and so I want to um, ask a question first to Mr. Przenowski and then um, Mr. Hartline after him. Um, my district is home to many medical device manufacturers, and they're on the front lines of innovation. I want to make sure we encourage research and development while safely repairing machines when they break. So should there be a different repair standard for life-saving equipment versus for an everyday household item? Uh, thank you so much. It's a, it's a really important question. I think safety and security have to be important concerns anytime we're talking about repair, regardless of who is making those repairs, whether it's an independent shop or uh, an authorized provider. And I think you're, you're absolutely right. Those risks uh, are more salient when we're talking about medical devices. But to the extent we are concerned about those issues, I don't think IP law is the right set of tools to use in order to ensure high quality repairs. Um, Volkswagen held all of the IP rights in its diesel gate vehicles. Uh, Abbott held all of the IP rights when they had to recall half a million pacemakers. Um, so I don't think who, I don't think the identity of the IP rights holder is what's going to get us to uh, safe and secure repairs. So I think the question is, how do we do that? That's frankly, it's beyond my uh, expertise, but I would turn to the real experts here. The FDA issued a report in 2018 that concluded that independent repair of medical devices is safe and effective. Um, I haven't seen evidence that runs to the contrary there, uh, but if I do, I'm certainly open to it, and I do think we have to have a really um, important conversation outside of the IP context about how we make sure that the, these repairs are safe. And, and who's responsible if they're not? Absolutely. Uh, Mr. Hartline, briefly, because I do have another question. Uh, yes, thank you. So I, I agree with medical equipment. That's when it, it's more important than ever that the right people are doing the repairs. And so uh, we, we saw in the recent rulemaking at the Library of Congress that there was an exemption granted temporarily for medical equipment, and now there's a lawsuit that's at the D.C. Circuit right now, uh, whether, you know, it, it, it's kind of about whether it's a good idea, but it's mostly about, you know, whether it violates the APA. Uh, but what I would say is there's absolutely nothing wrong with, with manufacturers parlaying their IP rights into repair opportunities. This is how they get more money and they can invest that money, more R&D, more investment, more innovation. And so this is just part of a business model that IP supports and there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. And a benefit is the right people are fixing it. Thank you. Um, Mr. Weens, I wanted to talk to you. Um, I, I loved your story. Um, but I'd, I'd like you to um, share with us whether you think that there are any cybersecurity implications for the right to repair? Well, across the board, the question is, who should, should be, should we be able to inspect what, what is happening with these devices? Uh, what we have found is that when you, when you have access to some amount of repair information, it makes, it makes information available to cybersecurity researchers who are able to, to do better work. Uh, we've found, I mean, I, I write software, I fix it, has had vulnerabilities in the past, and when we have, we work directly with researchers and, and they give us feedback and we improve it and we fix those problems. So when you have a little bit of, of sunshine on, on what's happening, uh, that, it, 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 that enablement of security research is, is really profound. And we've actually talked about you know, 
One of the challenges with Section 1201, it doesn't just ban repair tools, it also bans the distribution of cybersecurity tools. And so we've seen security researchers, uh, Apple sued a company that made a security research tool under 1201. Uh, and that tool has markedly made, made the world more secure. It's very popular amongst uh, government uh, security researchers. So I think, I think that's kind of the sweet spot is, is allow some third party inspection, uh, it, it'll make the product better. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, and thank you for your round of questioning. Uh, Mr. Fry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, it's July in South Carolina, and people are flocking in from all over the country to vacation. And uh, I'll tell you something, that one of the most profound disappointments in life is when you